the three-part program, Landscaping, Pride, Science, and Law, was produced for Citizens and Officials, Creating or Updating Lawn and Weed Ordinances for Public Health and Safety and Environmental Protection. In a country whose citizens sing about its amber waves of grain, the plant family of grasses has played a substantial role. Up until about 500 years ago, Native Americans, recognizing that the land's grasses fed the grazers that sustained their tribes, set fire to the prairie landscape to prevent its growing into shrublands or forests. Just a few hundred years ago, European Americans were also intent on employing grasses to feed livestock and to produce grains for milling, just as we do today. Over the last 200 years, the descendants of earlier settlers and new waves of immigrants began using turf grass to advertise their changing status, saying, in effect, that by owning lawns, they were more dignified than their humbler ancestors. A lawn was a declaration. It could distinguish its owner as distanced from poverty. It was a way of asserting, I have class. Americans aren't the first to use the language of architecture and landscape to strut their status. Historically, those English lords, inclined to take social ranking quite seriously, created lawns as symbols of wealth. The upper crust could appear to possess such vast estates and excesses beyond what was needed for food production that they could afford to squander land as lawn used for little or nothing. Of course, Great Britain and parts of Europe had the climate and cool season grasses to cultivate lawn with relative ease. Not so for the New World. America's grasslands evolved with a predominance of what is known as warm season grasses. Unlike their old world cousins, American grasses do not respond to continual mowing. So, Americans imported grasses from Europe, Asia, and North Africa. Even the parents of so-called Kentucky bluegrass ain't really from Kentucky. While one camp of landowners finds gratification in a carpet of short grass, for another contingent, living the American dream has come to mean owning a piece of authentic American landscape. Identified as natural landscapers, ecological landscapers, or native plant enthusiasts, a growing number of property owners are reducing their lawn area in favor of restoring the land with species that grew in their neighborhood prior to European settlement. Their sense of pride is connected to, as Aldo Leopold termed it, a land ethic. That is, a set of moral principles built upon preserving the elements of the world so that these resources would be available for generations to come and to prevent the extinction of experience, which is a result of being out of touch with nature. To get a sense of what gives these homeowners their pride, listen to this essay written about a half-acre yard in Big Bend, Wisconsin. What is this place with my name on its deed? This place before you is my reference library regularly consulted with queries about nature. It also serves as a dance floor to courtship rituals for countless species, including my own. It is a living perfumery, no doubt, and a veritable gift shop, supplying bouquets, plants and seeds, teas and nibbles. It must be some kind of market, too, as it has brought forth rhubarb pies and berry jellies and state fair first place wines. At times, it's nothing more than a canvas for a creative mind, laying traps for flattery, and thereby it becomes a matchmaker of friends who began as admirers. This landscape, 
works as a demonstration of bioengineering, as it baffles noise, prevents erosion, and channels winds. It further acts as an agent of the environment as it builds soil, filters pollutants, and generates oxygen. The assessor would appraise it as a property of increasing worth. Those who own native plant nurseries would see prosperity from this consumer. The life scientist might regard its diverse species as a pharmacopoeia of medicinals, or simply a garden resisting infestation. The patriot, or historian, would applaud its tribute to provenance. A wise teacher would recognize it as a classroom. Any child would see it as a playground. An artist would perceive it as an infinite series of picturesque scenes. The contemplative would see this as a holy place. Those who fear God would think it a veneration of his creation. Those who fear mankind would see it as an act of preservation. The people of third world countries would see a land of plenty, unsquandered. Oddly enough, the very best definition for this wildlife habitat may be that it is our home entertainment system. The colors advance in their performance so as never to rerun a season quite the same way twice. From this vantage point, we have beheld meteors and fossils, herons and hummingbirds, maggots and manure, hail and human tears. We have pond soaked during July's heat, gazing up at hundreds of yellow blooms, and cross-country skied upon December's snow, admiring thousands of white-capped stems. This oasis that rewards the senses and lifts the mind and comforts one's body is all things to this family. We have envisioned the grandeur of its pre-settlement landscape and resuscitated it to the best of our amateur abilities. We invite you to visit our piece of earth and encourage you to restore the place to which you hold the deed. Proceed to video part two.